these guys survived the David Kahn era of Timberwolves basketball and live to tell about it. It's Flagrant Howls. Sports dad Judd Zilgad, how are we feeling here? How are we? We've had to wait all week Yeah, long. anticipation. We're feeling anticipatory about uh, Friday night, which I yeah. think is going to be absolutely fantastic. The excitement is off the charts, and it should be. Oh, my gosh. It's good. So, yeah, just and we'll get to a couple talking points here, including Anthony Edwards got some MVP votes, not first place votes, but we did see the voting results came out. So we'll get mm-hmm. to some some stuff here. Just a quick episode to say hello. And by the way, thank you guys uh, for the first time in podcast history. Flagrant Howls hit the top 10 on oh. Apple's national basketball podcast charts. <laughs> Right above Pat Bet. Top ten bets right above Pat. It's above KG. Yep. Which mean which means that if you do not subscribe to Flagrant Howls, we don't talk to you. We're not going to answer your questions. No. Get your microphone out of our face. Yeah. 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 In fact, get out of the shot if you could. It should be great. Or you can open your phone, click subscribe, and then you can ask me whatever you want to. Then you can ask questions. Yeah. (laughs) Go ahead. Uh, but tomorrow night, so not only is Target Center going to be absolutely jammed to the rafters, I think I checked yesterday, the get-in price on the secondary market was like, to sit like upper deck, you know, row W was like 350 bucks, I think before fees. I don't, I haven't checked yet today, wow. but for people that can't be in the arena for game three or just choose not to pay $400 to sit in the top... So there's 11 official watch parties at bars in and around downtown Minneapolis. I think you can find that list on Timberwolves.com, but they are they are promoting like 11 official Timberwolves watch parties. And then there's a bunch of unofficial ones all over the place. So we've got, we're, we're not even, we're halfway through the second round and we're already just, the whole city of Minneapolis is holding watch parties for this team. Um, it's going to be pretty wild as we keep going here and you just hope that the wolves can absorb whatever punch denver throws maybe they lose one of these games but right come out of this weekend at least having if you haven't swept at least maintain a 3-1 lead would be would be my plea and what's cool here is because the wolves um in this round did not have home court advantage but by jumping to a 2-0 lead it's even more fun because they're coming home up by two yeah. So like the anticipation, because because when they beat the Suns the first two games of the first round, that was cool. But then you go to Phoenix, which is fine. But I think the games being in town now, being downtown up 2-0 is so cool. And yeah, I I think Denver is going to have some pride left here for sure. And I think Denver is going to come out, as we talked about on yesterday's show, in the first quarter tomorrow night and try and, and make a statement. Denver's problem is, can you continue that for an entire game with the way that the Wolves play? Because the Wolves aren't going to change the way that they play. The only thing that could go drastically wrong is if officials change what they've been doing and start to call fouls that aren't fouls. But like, if you look at what the Timberwolves blueprint for playing is, it's not predicated on some type of fortune. It's predicated on defense. So like... Denver's going to come out and try and make a statement and they might do that, but can they do that? Can they take it to the wolves offensively for 48 minutes? And My guess is times no th- times four games. That oh, they no, have I, to but win, I'm just right? saying yeah. one game, Phil. I'm, I'm yeah. just saying like tomorrow night, like Mike Malone said, we're the champions. We should play like that. Okay. So he's challenging his players, which I don't blame him one bit, yeah. but I'm just saying for one game, Like, you can come out for a quarter and for sure go as hard as you possibly can. Can you do that for four quarters against a team that really relies on a defensive structure that's, as far as I can tell, pretty damn sound? Well, and this is where, like, the Wolves should... The Wolves should have a healthy respect, and they should walk humbly here, and they should understand the the punch that will probably be thrown at them and all those things. Have that respect. Brace for it. But... What should make the Wolves and fans feel a little bit more comfortable here for what's about to happen if Denver does indeed throw a punch is Denver's answer is to play more like the defending champions that they've been, right? Which is more physicality, more Jamal Murray coming off screens and hitting his little Jamal Murray jump shots. But the problem for Denver is the things that they're going to try and lean into, like be more physical, Jamal Murray coming off screens and going off for 30, 35 points, whatever it is. Like the Wolves also do those things on their end, maybe even better. Like Anthony Edwards is a better version of what the Nuggets have in Jamal Murray. Yeah. A more physical version, certainly, 
than what the Nuggets have in Jamal Murray. Yes. And the Wolves have been able to throw all these big man answers, not to completely stifle Nikola Jokic, but to make it harder and more uncomfortable for him than pretty much any opponent that they've seen. The last 18 times these two teams played each other, the Wolves have won 10 of them. The Wolves are 10 and 8 yeah. against this Nuggets team over the last, what, two, whatever it is, two plus years. Yes. Uh, three years. And so it th- th- that was the key, like getting up 2-0 in their house, now coming back, feeding off this crowd's energy is such an important factor. And again, I fully expect Denver to come out and play a lot more like the champions that they are. But even when they were playing like the champions they were a year ago, the Wolves gave them fits in some of those games without Jaden well, McDaniels, without Nas Reed. In game two, I, I mean, there's no doubt that the Wolves dominated, the Nuggets got frustrated, and and unraveled. But, you know, game one, it's not, it's not like the Nuggets are this team that's like, oh my God, they're just not that good, right? Mm-hmm. Game one, the Wolves, I mean, let's start with Joker. Joker literally right now, well, and hell, Gobert didn't play game two, but Joker right now, if Gobert is playing, has to go through Cat and then Gobert. And, and like, you could see in those two, two games, you could see his will is being tested. I think what the Wolves do is the equivalent of fighting fires. I think what they do is they take a team's offensive philosophy and remove its oxygen. And it goes out. Mm -hmm. Now, if they want to work through that, the Nuggets, more power to them. But, you know, it's funny, Phil. You really see guys, and and I mean, it's pro sports. uh, You see guys get tested. And you saw it with the Suns, too, right? Which is, okay, we know what we're going to do. How hard are you going to work to make sure we can? And and the thing is, it's it's all work. So it's not like the Rockets back in the day where it's like, well, we're going to shoot threes. And if we miss them all, we're still going to shoot threes. And if we miss them all, we'll we'll just lose. Mm-hmm. It it is a philosophy. It is a the wolves are leading a defensive lifestyle, which is a really really difficult thing in this league. And I really do think that we are seeing teams trying to like process how hard do we how hard do we want to work to try and win four times against this. And to your point about threes, like the. Like the 0 for 20 set, the Rockets built under Mike D'Antoni, James Harden, you know, Chris Paul, this offensive juggernaut that just hoisted a bazillion threes every single game. And they they just they won the math battle in the regular season. They won the math battle in some playoff series. But there's as they found out in was it a game six or a game the game seven against the Warriors when they went 0 for 27 at one point yep. shooting threes. There's a certain vol. If you're basing your success off having to make threes, like that is your, you do some other things, but if you don't make threes, you're screwed. Well, there's some volatility. You're still shooting a basketball from 24 plus feet away, and you're going to go through stretches where variance catches up to you. There's a lot less variance if the key to your winning basketball games is defense. Yes. Because you're not going to go 0 for 27. From defense, you know, like now they might hit now there might be games and maybe Friday night is one of them where even if you're playing clamps defense, the other team is just hitting hand in face threes and contested threes and they're just making a higher percentage of contested uh, contested shots. That certainly happens. We've seen it like the Kings did that in a game in the regular season where they hit like or they call like fouls. 19 threes and a half. Yeah, like or they, they could yeah. call fouls. That, yeah. that would be my biggest thing. But I would argue that if you play this process of defense yes. throughout the rest of the series, yep. while they might steal a game or two by going gangbusters with a hand in their face or the officials, the, the, the officiating crew one night decides to call more fouls, I, I don't know that a team can beat you four times in five games to win a series once you've taken a 2-0 lead. So that's, that's the, right. the hope if you're a Wolves fan and the Timberwolves in that locker room right now. Right now, I, I think that there is a very realistic chance that Denver wins a game or two. The thing is, they're going to have to work so hard. At, to your point, are you going to double that? So like if you win two games, okay, great, we've won two yep. games. Are you going to be able to work hard? Be, because the Wolves would literally, if if they defensively don't play as well for an extended period, that's a fixable thing. Like it would literally be a team that's worked its ass off now for six games 
saying, okay, we worked really hard. We're, we're good. We're not going to work as hard. Mm-hmm. I don't see that. So like, there's yeah. just, there's, this is one place. And I, I don't know if basketball is routinely like this hockey is. This is one place where you can a thousand percent say that the playoffs are different. Like the wolves, what the wolves are doing, we sort of see, saw, right? Like we saw it in December at times in January, but mm-hmm. you didn't see the consistency there. Like you are, if you're playing the wolves now, you are getting them on on a, basically a defensive bender. Mm-hmm. Good luck stopping it. Yeah, and they've had it's the. I think the rest has been beneficial because it is it is hard as it, that, mm-hmm. there's a reason why mm-hmm. teams don't play this high caliber defense every single game for 82 games because you'd be completely gassed yes. if you treated every game like a playoff game. So I I get the human nature in that. Of course, even though the wolves clearly had another level or two to get to, as we've seen in the playoffs, they were still the number one net rating defense in the league in the regular season. So it's all relative. Everyone's intensity wraps up, ramps up in the postseason. Okay, they ramp theirs up, and it's an even more historic level of defense. But um, the the rest periods where you got from the Suns' end of regular season ass-kicking, you got a week of rest and study and Chris Finch and Mike Nori and these coaches. Then you take care of Phoenix in four games, you get to rest again and you get to game plan and draw up plans for Denver. And then that series starts a couple days early. So I know people are kind of complaining. Why do we have to wait? And other people are saying that this is a great advantage for Denver because they get to rest and clear their minds and go back to the drawing board. But guess what? The defense that the Wolves are playing drains a lot of energy. They also get four yeah. days off to rest their legs. I don't know. It's great. No, like, like I, I think it's great for the Wolves. I disagree. If I'm Denver, I wanted to play like Wednesday. I don't think I want to sit around. And and what I thought, and I think I was wrong, was Jamal Murray has been lousy. Partially, in large part, credit Wolves. Mm-hmm. But he's hurt. He's clearly hurt. And so a lot of things, so, so his frustration, calf, right? His frustration also comes from he, he can't do things he is used to doing. I thought originally when, when the Nuggets got a break, or somewhat of a break between the first round and second round that he would come back healthier. It does not look to be be the case. So he might have the type of injury that just needs like extensive time off. Yeah. If I'm Denver off of that ass whooping on Monday, I think I would have preferred to just get back to playing like Wednesday. Yeah, no, you, you, you might be right. But the I Wolves, I think it's great for him. On the Wolves side too. I love the way that Anthony Edwards answered a question a couple days ago and and I don't remember what the exact wording of the question was but it was hey I'm sure you guys expect Denver to come out and put up a fight and throw a lot of punches figuratively in this game three and Anthony Edwards said well we're punching too man oh yeah yeah we expect them to punch but guess what we're going to be here punching as well and that's all the wolves do Mm -hmm. like that like that's what they do they want a box Yep. I think they they would they would welcome whatever Denver has to bring in the first yes. six to ten minutes of this game. Um, another question for you. So I was listening to a couple. Uh, one was a clip that I saw from Stephen A. Smith's first take show on ESPN. And then I listened to the first 30 minutes of Bill Simmons podcast yesterday. Bill Simmons monologued about the Timberwolves for a half hour to start his podcast yesterday. And like there was like a little bit of a Denver side street about. What happens if Denver goes from winning a championship? Oh, my God, this is going to be a dynasty to holy crap. They got swept out of the playoffs in the second round. And then he did a whole thing on maybe what if the Wolves are the team that kind of takes over. But both Bill Simmons and Stephen A. Smith, two of the most prominent NBA national talking heads, both declared that the Timberwolves are currently title favorites to win the Larry O'Brien trophy. I personally... I'm not ready to go anywhere near that until they take care of Denver and then we get to survey the landscape. If they get through this series, hold on to this thing, yep. then let's start to survey the second half of the, the playoff bracket because we're not even halfway through. Agreed. So I don't I don't have any desire in having like a, are they favorites to win the title conversation yet? But what do you make of some of the most prominent national NBA talking heads saying the Timberwolves are current with Porzingis being out for Boston – that the Timberwolves are the current champion favorites. I think it's a fair conversation, but I'm I'm with you. Here's what I really want to see. I really want to see OKC beat Dallas, and I want to see the Wolves and Thunder collide because I I would need to 
reassess my thoughts there. And and look, I think the Wolves are playing championship basketball. I think what they are doing when you watch the blueprint, right? I think it's championship basketball. Um, but I also think it's getting way ahead of things to proclaim them the favorites right now because the Thunder are damn good too. The Thunder are young. The Thunder are hungry. The Thunder can bring different things. Here's the thing I'll go to with Phoenix and Denver, and, and it's why OKC intrigues me because they don't have this going against them, and it's something else the Wolves don't have going against them. Phoenix lack depth, and Phoenix is old. They're not a young team. Yeah, you, you know, K, KD is fantastic, but as Ant said, he's like 36. He's like, because the, the question was, uh, asked to Ant a couple of days ago, do you like look at Denver now and look at the goats there? And and he's like, like Jamal Murray. Jamal yeah. Murray's 27, dude. I'm going to be like 23. He's yeah. not a go, you know, he's not a great, he, and, and he said, don't start, don't try and start something here. I still admire him a lot. But like KD's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. You know, so, but Phoenix was short on depth and Phoenix is not young. Denver to me looks incredibly tired. Um, and they're being, uh, credit to the Wolves again, they're being worn down, but they're also a team that won a championship. And th this is why I think the dynasty conversation in all sports ne needs to be sort of squashed is it takes so much to win one championship now and you're off season becomes so relatively short yeah. that I think this whole thing of, well, Denver might reel off three in a row can be absolute nonsense. Denver right now looks like a team that gave it's all to win a championship and bravo, but that assures you of nothing. Now where OKC intrigues me is that they are young and hungry like the wolves are. So I, I think it's, I think the ant story is fantastic. And I think people are now naturally rooting for ant. I think the way the Wolves play is fantastic. I'm with you. I am not anywhere near, though, declaring that, like, well, if they beat if they beat the Nuggets, that's it. Denver is a very good team, but as far as this, like, dynasty talk, and you could, I thought you couldn't get through, through them. Phil, you've been talking since, like, January about the fact that you thought that the Nuggets were a favorable matchup mm -hmm. for the Wolves and, you know, that the Wolves had a chance there. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, this is not this is not trying to cut through the eighty four Lakers to me. Yeah, you're. I yes, I I, I also think on the Oklahoma City front. Just to go back, because you start talking about like you kind of want to see Oklahoma City and, and the Timberwolves. Oklahoma City is so much more connected and dynamic than like Phoenix as you watch these teams play, and I. Yes. My fear of Phoenix was clearly misplaced now that we saw that series play out. We saw the Wolves clearly withheld some adjustments, and, you know, I was wrong. I was, Phoenix obviously wasn't the worst possible opponent for the Wolves. Um, Oklahoma City scares me a little for two reasons. One, Shea Gilgis-Alexander is just a force and an energizer bunny. Number two, the Thunder have still played a nine-man rotation in these playoff games. They've 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 played nine guys an average yep. of double digit minutes. Yep. So they they run deep still even in the playoffs. They have one of the best players in the world in Shea Gildas Alexander. I mean Jalen Williams is an excellent scorer. Chet Holmgren obviously is a seven foot praying mantis unicorn. But the one thing about them is of that nine man rotation, the oldest player is Aaron Wiggins, who's twenty five years old. So like they're playing nine dudes all under the age of twenty six. Yep. At some point, does having a Rudy Gobert and a Mike Conley and even like the playoff experience that Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns have gained over the last few years, is there if 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 you look at those rosters and say, let's call the rosters even, even though I think I think the I, I like the Wolves roster better than I like Oklahoma City's roster right now. Mm -hmm. No, that roster is gonna be connected for like the next four to five years and it's gonna be incredible. But does the, does that extra level of experience matter for something as you get further into the pressure cooker and the playoffs? Um, do the Wolves actually have the best player in that series in Anthony Edwards' regular season? Maybe it was SGA. Again, we're getting ahead because the Wolves still need two more wins against Denver. Right. But like, it is kind of fun to project some of the stuff out and the possibilities here. Um, one other thing for you, Anthony Edwards did receive some MVP love 
We got the full MVP voting results. Obviously, Nikola Jokic winning his third MVP in four years. Yeah, He got 79 first-place votes. SGA got 15 first-place votes. Luka Doncic, four. And then Giannis was the only one to get a first-place vote. He got one. Anthony Edwards finished seventh in the voting. In order, it was Nikola Jokic, number one, Shea Gildas-Alexander, Luka Doncic, Giannis, Jalen Brunson, Jason Tatum, and then Anthony Edwards got one second-place vote, one third-place vote, one fourth-place vote, and three fifth-place votes. Interesting. Like, the fact that I actually wasn't sure that he would get even top seven respect here, but if he's climbing up the MVP voting charts and he might get first or second team all NBA, we'll see where that shakes out. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I bet Ant is, assuming that that he has an Ant year uh, next season, I bet Ant is easily top five. Yeah, because like Jokic probably going to be in that mix still. Shea Gilgis-Alexander. I mean, all these guys are going to be in that mix still. And just now, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure that, that the way that, that this goes, that, that you've got Eastern Conference people who vote who don't watch a ton of the Timberwolves. You got Western Conference who don't watch as much of the Timberwolves because the common thread here is clearly a lot of people didn't watch a lot of the Timberwolves. Yeah. That's going to change now. And yeah. so there, there's going to be a bias towards these playoffs, and there should be of, oh, my God, this guy was a stud. So I wouldn't be surprised at, at all if he's top five but there's a whole different discussion too at some point to have about 2024 25 because it's an olympic year and it's going to play in the olympics which i think is going to be great Mm -hmm. for him but Mm -hmm. that's a lot of basketball again but uh yeah i think the perception i think these playoffs now are going to flip the perception of ant on its head as, as far as the recognition that he didn't get he's now going to get in spades if 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 they can close out this series it would put him, regardless of what happens after that, like at 22, leading your team through Durant, Booker, and Jokic and getting yep. to the Western Conference Finals maybe ahead of schedule, so to speak, Yep, would put him on such a crazy platform. Um, I mean, he's already on one right now, but like the world is waiting for them to finish the oh, story yeah. here with yeah. this series. But man, and God, like you, you saw flashes the last couple of years, but to see him as a playmaker putting it together like this all in one. I mean, he's no defensively. Yeah. He, who was saying, was it, was it, who was saying, Oh, Tom Crean, Doogie talked to Tom Crean. And we talked about that on uh, the scoop session on Minnesota sports with Mackie and Judd and Crean talked about how early in his career in college. And even like early in the NBA, he would come down the court. He would predetermine that he was going to shoot on that possession. Yep. And you, you saw a lot of that the first two or three years of ant, like, Okay, he's got that look in his eye. He's probably going to shoot regardless of context here. Right. He does that a couple times a game now in the playoffs, but he comes down the court with this calculating look of how can I make the right play for this possession in this well, moment within this context. And and part of that is he's been coached well now. In, in fact, uh, Finch did. Finch went on the Dan Patrick show, I think it was yesterday, and talked about the – maturation of ant and and how I, he called him an old soul because he takes coaching well and mm-hmm. and he, he's like he wants to know what he doesn't do well and this gets back to the, the conversation of how much good coaching can impact a player from being good or great or superstar right and so i think with ant like ant ant does a, or did a lot of things that probably they were special but they weren't great because he didn't know but he was willing to absorb the coaching and the and the coaches were were smart enough to identify things cuz yeah i mean you definitely see a different player now mm-hmm. you definitely see that and and as a guy who usually hates international basketball competition i will say this i think that when we go back someday and look at the arc of ants like career as far as points where it changed i think his experience last summer in the world cup of basketball was pivotal there's a certain age where if you're if you're young enough in your early to mid 20s you don't really get the wear and tear on your like there's not really a right. oh, is he going to be well, tired for the season and there's an factor. experience factor that yeah that that overrides the potential for wear and tear you you can look at 
there's a lot of players in history. I mean, Dwayne Wade, Kobe, going back yep. to MJ, that the the Olympics and the competition, being around the best players in the world, the best coaches in the world, and then playing against international competition, high stakes basketball. Yep. Where the, it was kind of a pivot point, a launching pad to get to a a different level or to win championships, to unlock another level to your superstar status. And I think the World Cup last year and the Olympics this summer and being around, like the fact that he was around Steve Kerr all summer last yep. year and, yep. and to some realize, of these other guys. And it, it's got to be really weird and special when you realize that you are the best player on an all-star team of NBA players. It's very powerful, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. But, but I mean, you're probably thinking, you know, I... I mean, I think everyone questions themselves, right, at some point. But then you've got the ball, you're the star, and it's an all-star team. And everyone sort of looks at, hey, go ahead and shoot. Because mm -hmm. I, I think you can go through, especially like in basketball, I think you're exactly right. I think you can go through the timeline of players and see pivotal points. These playoffs, pivotal, right? Mm -hmm. But I thought that that World Cup of basketball was absolutely huge because it was just so clear – that this guy was was special and it wasn't on his team it was on a team that you know a lot of guys could have gotten the ball and and had the ball a lot and dumb question those those olympic games are this summer right yep so you yep. th dude this Fair. off season it's going to be nuts you're going to have so the wolves have a first round pick so that'll be end of june they will draft again or yep. trade it or whatever yep uh, well they can't trade it cuz they have to have you have to have first round picks in back to back years but they'll draft but then they'll have they'll be like an off season. They they don't have like cap space to sign free agents, but there might be a couple little moves here and there with the the league year turning over. And then you've got the Anthony Edwards, I believe, is part of the Netflix basketball documentary that's coming out. And then Anthony Edwards in the Olympics in August. Yep. Yep. It's gonna be a summer of the summer of wolves here, baby. I'm hoping Gobert stays home. And I think with the baby he might. Yeah, it's yeah, go you're in your thirties now. I don't Rudy. need Gobert to you're play. Dad. Yeah. I I I will I will go to my grave saying Gobert's participation the year before he he started here like so two years back now for Team France was the worst thing possible. Yeah. He got hurt. It Indeed. was really tough. Yeah. But but with Ant, I think this is awesome. Yeah. So we're pumped for tomorrow night. We're going to be live on the Score North YouTube channel for a flagrant house post game recap from courtside. For games three and you games and four, mm -hmm. but you and me, our guy Kyle Tige is going to be in the house, and he might nice. swing by as well as he's he's doing stuff for us and for Dane Moore. And uh, yeah, thanks again, you guys, for making Flagrant Howls one of the ten best, biggest, brightest Take basketball that, Pat podcasts. In Don't the country. talk to me, Pat Bev. Apple so you charts. subscribe. <laughs> Don't talk to me. This is a Timberwolves lifestyle podcast.